spiritual adultery. There is more to the Ten Commandments than many of us have imagined. We do not sometimes think of the spiritual side of them. Meanwhile, spiritual offenses can be more grievous than physical ones. God ordered us not to commit adultery. Exodus 20.14, thou shalt not commit adultery. If we are forbidden from committing adultery against our fellow humans, how much more grievous would it be for us to commit spiritual adultery? All the Ten Commandments have their spiritual sides, and we can actually break those laws against God. Many believers are already guilty of spiritual adultery, and they need to repent before God's jealousy will burn against them. Spiritual adultery is sin. Flee from it. The concept of spiritual adultery against God is a major theme throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah 54.5 For your husband is your maker, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the whole earth. Isaiah spoke of God as the husband of the Israelites. As the spiritual Israel, believers are also the bride of Christ in the New Testament. Revelation 19, 7-9 Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The concept of Christ being the husband and us the saints being the bride symbolizes the need for us to stay faithful to him. Let us look at Paul's concern for the church's faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 11, 2-4 For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he comes preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Here again we see saints referred to as the bride who must remain loyal to the husband, i.e. Christ. Worshipping anything else other than Christ is akin to spiritual adultery, also known as idolatry. Again and again throughout the Bible we are reminded of this husband and bride analogy because that is how important it is to not commit spiritual adultery. The comparisons of a husband and wife relationship to Christ and the church's relationship is evident. The commandment on how a wife should treat the husband and vice versa is twofold. Ephesians 5.22-33 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The message here is undeniable. Adultery is so detestable that it is the only acceptable reason for divorce in the Bible. Matthew 19.9 No wonder God usually turns away from the Israelites each time they go into idolatry, a sign of spiritual adultery. And he will allow their enemies to torture them until they cry back to him. God does not ever want his relationship with his people to be broken. But one of those things that easily breaks our relationship with him is when we commit spiritual adultery. No man or woman will be happy when his or her spouse is unfaithful. Why then should we commit adultery against God when we would not tolerate such from our spouse? God is jealous. He wants all the desires of our hearts to be towards him. Jeremiah 3.20 reads, Surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. We commit spiritual adultery when we put other things in our life first before God. God is the essence of our existence, and we must prioritize him in our lives. We commit spiritual 
sexual adultery when we worship idols and serve anything else apart from God. We commit spiritual adultery when the pleasures of this world mean more to us than our relationship with God. We also commit spiritual adultery when we consult mediums and practice necromancy. God accused the Israelites of adultery. I hope we'll not be guilty of the same if God should open our case files. Let's consider God's boundless love in Hosea 3, 1 through 3. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for fifteen shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. It was amazing that God ordered Prophet Hosea to remain committed to Gomer, a harlot. God used the commitment of Hosea to symbolize his faithfulness and patient love with his erring people. God loves us so much that he paid the price for our redemption. He sacrificed his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from the bondage of sin. Adam and Eve committed spiritual adultery and they messed up with the devil. They turned the entire human race to the children of Satan, but God bought us back with the blood of Jesus. Jeremiah 3.1 reads, they say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Jeremiah 3, 12 through 14. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion. God is still interested in us despite the fact that we are unfaithful to him. We have left our first love and we have followed after the desires of our hearts. We have valued other things than God by erecting them as altars and as gods in our hearts. We have positioned our careers, businesses, finances, and the likes as rivals to God, yet he calls to us to return to him. God so much loved us that while we were yet in our sins, he came to our rescue. He didn't wait for us to come to him. Rather, he came to us. Spiritual adultery aches the heart of God. After proving his love for us by redeeming us from the bondage of Satan, we are expected to be loyal. Everything that is not of God raises itself up against God. So we constantly have to fight and remove idols in our lives. We have to cast them down, but they will be there as long as we live here on earth. Exodus 20 verses 3 to 5. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The issue of idol worship is greatly abhorred by God, so much that it was the first of the Ten Commandments God gave the Israelites. Our God is a jealous God. Jealousy is a very strong emotion, and God feels very deeply about the fact that he wants exclusive worship because he is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. I don't know what in your life is trying to take up the position as an idol, but can that thing or person heal you? Can it give you eternal life? Psalms 16 verse 4 says that the sorrow of those who run after other gods will multiply. Idolatry will initially look pleasurable, only to turn out into sorrow in later days. What is it that is taking the place of God in your heart? Matthew 6 verse 24 No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Make your mind up today whom you will serve. You can't serve two masters.